and good morning. Three, three is all. I only do three. I only do three good mornings. But I am very happy to see you all here promptly and ready for our new uh, Shamel se uh, season. University for a Day launches our fall semester, as you know, and in a way defines the Schemmel Forum as a place where people gather to experience the joy of learning together. We aim always to give serious thought to significant ideas and issues, and of the past, and issues of the past, and muse on our prospects for the future. University for a Day has always focused on America and the world. Today we find ourselves in a uniquely uncomfortable state in that regard. Without looking back naively for the good old days, we yearn for more order, more honesty, and more strategic policy, and less spontaneity and chaos. On the international front, we are concerned about our relationships with allies and our president's unusual affinity for autocrats. Domestically, we are falling back on our efforts toward racial justice and respect for immigrants. We won't solve these problems today, but we hope to understand them better. A hearty welcome to all of you uh, for joining us in this intellectual immersion. We are here together to listen, learn, and discuss. At the Schemmel Forum, we always devote ample time to Q&A because we come together as participants and not as audience. With that, and before we plunge into the business at hand, I'd like you to join me in thanking the Frieder Foundation for sponsoring University for a Day this year and next year as well. The, the, the uh, principals of that foundation couldn't be here today because they're babysitting, so we'll <laughs> give them that credit. Also note that the scholars we will hear from today uh, have something in common, though their areas of exper exper expertise are different. They are deeply ensconced in their own disciplines, taking us backward in time, but at the same time keenly committed to the present, to policies and practices of today. So we're going to start with Mark Mac Meyer. And so let me introduce our first speaker, who will give us a philosophical perspective on the economic and social ideas that are part of our history, sometimes dormant and sometimes front and center. Our own philosophy professor, Matt Meyer, will lead us in discovery of the real road to serfdom, and he will be, given for, he will be giving him his views for us to discuss on just what that road is. Matt Meyer is an associate professor of philosophy, director of the pre-law advisory program, and an active member of the faculty's humanities initiative. Matt has advanced degrees from Harvard and the University of Vienna and has specialized in ancient Greek and 19th century German philosophy. And in recent years, he has been looking into our own country and its democracy. Please welcome Matt to the podium. Uh, well, thank you, Sandra, for that kind uh, introduction. I guess I'll say I'm, I'm wired a little bit, so as I assume this is all working, so I could kind of move about a little more freely. Hopefully I use my hands a lot when I speak, that it doesn't catch one of these and they go flying off. I'll say again, good morning. Uh, good morning. So Sandra said there's only three times, but we'll go for four. Um, I have to say 9.30 on a Saturday sometimes feels about like 8 or 8.30 on a regular weekday, but Sandra and I actually teach a course uh, each morning starting around 8.30 on democratic citizenship, right, Sandra? So, yeah, so we do that. So I'm hopefully we can kind of get things rolling. Uh, the title of my talk is The Real Road to Serfdom. I will say that initially, and I'm gonna kind of reinsert it, there's a question mark there. So in some sense, it's kind of an exploratory uh, question uh, that we're gonna look at, a hypothesis, something that we can open up for discussion. Um, it's based, uh, maybe to start off, um, it is based not on this book, which I found last night. Uh, the, uh, there is a book called The Road to Serfdom with a U. So there's an important distinction there that we want to kind of start out where it's early in the morning. So I thought we'd start out easy. Um, this is actually, it's really interesting and I'll come back to this a little bit later. Uh, but this is part of a series of books uh, asking, do your kids understand freedom? So they're written for kids about between five and 10 years old. So I'll, I'll return to that. So 
Uh, the book, The Road to Serfdom, uh, which sounds actually kind of nice right now, if you go off for a little bit of a surf, is actually a kid's version of the book that I will be discussing. Um, and so just to give you some background more on the title, uh, there's a thinker uh, who I'll be talking about, Friedrich uh, Hayek, um, and he wrote a book published in 1944 called The Road to Serfdom. Uh, this book uh, was, there was attempts, or it was being made popular uh, by Glenn Beck, uh, warning us uh, about uh, the potential dangers of a road to serfdom. Uh, does anyone know the context in which uh, Glenn Beck was kind of promoting the reading of Hayek to warn us of the threat? Uh, the uh, Affordable Care Act, <laughs> Obamacare. The idea is that we need to understand what's going on with that, that the Affordable Care Act might put us on a road to, to serfdom. So here's the question or the hypothesis, thesis. Um, Hayek's thinking, and I'm going to potentially, has, who's heard of neoliberalism? Okay, good. So this is a term that's becoming more and more uh, frequent, and to some degree what I'm saying uh, today or exploring is probably a kind of an idea that you could pick out if you're a frequent reader of The Guardian. Um, the, the kind of ideas that are expressed there uh, are very much in line with what I'm talking about here. <coughs> but it's a form of neoliberalism that represents the real road uh, to serfdom. So in other words, it's Hayek's own political project that might put us on a way uh, down a path that makes us lose freedom. Now things get tricky, that's the kind of underlying idea of serfdom. Things can get tricky, I don't know if you can read this, this might be getting a little, this is up here is a little smaller than I remember. But the simple point, and I can uh, up here is, Hayek's real concern is the loss of individual, personal, private freedom. The kind of sphere that you have independent of government activity or interference. That's the most cherished thing for neoliberals, and that's the, um, what he's worried about losing. For me, I'm concerned about that, that's true, but I'm also concerned about uh, political freedom, the ability to participate, the right to participate in, uh, the uh, power to affect and shape um, our democratic society. So the, the right that we have to uh, participate in the shaping of the laws that we ourselves live under. Um, so that's uh, one of the things I'm concerned about and the idea is that neoliberalism puts us on a path to kind of losing that uh, democratic um, capacity, that, that role to kind of, that, that ability to govern ourselves. This is a continuation of previous talks. So some of the ideas uh, you uh, will be hearing now if you were here in 2012. I gave a talk, Views on Greed and Corruption from Antiquity to Modern Times. Uh, that picture up there, it's a little bit faint. It's, uh, does anyone know who that is, if you can see it? <laughs> Phil Don Donahue and Milton Friedman. That was the interview in which Milton Friedman told us that greed was good. Um, Milton Friedman, along with Friedrich Hayek, are kind of the two, I would say, fundamental uh, proponents um, uh, of kind of neoliberal thinking. And what I argued there was that although greed does, in some sense, as Friedman claims, animate productive energies and make capitalism flourish, what we need is we have to protect or prevent that kind of, let's say, greedy mentality from getting into political life. Because you actually need people, when they're there, um, constructing the laws, creating legislations, who have an eye to the common good rather than exclusively their own self-interest. And so if you get Gordon Gecko types into political power, that's a real concern. The second thing that I said in 2014 was a concern, I raised a concern about the epidemic of narcissism and claimed that it was a threat to democracy. Um, 2014. Uh, the <laughs> I gave two parts. One is that self-love causes us to overestimate what we deserve. So we think that all the kind of fruits of our labor are due to our own particular efforts. And what we do is we downplay or forget what we kind of owe to the larger community. It was to some degree a response to the We Built It platform. What that does in turn is it leads us to reject demands of democratic equality and the requirements for kind of again notions of the common good. That was one part. The other part was 
a concern about self-love, shifting the idea, at least kind of in the 30s, a conception of the American dream. The American dream was originally, when the phrase was formulated, an idea of making America itself as the entire country. So when we, dream, we dreamt that it was kind of a collective dream about us having a better country and opportunity for all. My claim was that that has turned into something, you know, this was going on in the Gilded Age, of course, but a focus on the American dream being building a private empire. And again, the concern was that once you get these kind of private empires off the ground, then those private empires or personal empires kind of move into politics either indirectly through the influence of money or they actually enter into politics itself. So I talked about, uh, you know, the desire of this kind of narcissistic tendency and the tension between uh, democracy with individuals, again, trying to make them into certain sorts of royalty. There was a documentary out on the seagulls who built a home that looked like Versailles. And the very notion that if you're committed to democracy that that itself um, would be problematic. And I ended the talk with the idea that the real problem with narcissism is that if you point out that it kind of conflicts with democracy, the problem is that that person doesn't care because the underlying uh, desire is that you not have a government of, by, and for the people, but a government of, by, and for me. And so we ended with an image of Narcissus. Of course, if the talk had been done a little later. <laughs> that's what I had in mind. <laughs> Where are these ideas coming from? I'll just kind of be straightforward. We don't have to have any secret about it. Um, I actually, what I'm talking about here is not, I guess I would say, an area of expertise. It's something that got me into philosophy and kind of through my acquaintance with Sondra has kind of brought me back into, I guess, the world of more practical affairs, affairs that deal with today, where I do feel like I have some comfort in terms of an expertise where I would write about it, publish about it as Plato. And Plato gives us a classic account of how democratic form of government transitions into tyranny. Now, if you kind of folks, I don't know if you've seen this, but there was actually a lot of folks writing about this around 2016. And one is a conservative commenta commentator, Andrew Sullivan, uh, who wrote an article about the events of 2016 couldn't help but um, make him think back to his days in college when he read The Republic. Um, with Sullivan, the claim is that we're too democratic. The reason why um, we're kind of having the problems that we do is an excess of democracy. Um, I agree with Sullivan that we can apply some of Plato's ideas um, to our situation, but I think if you look at Plato a little more carefully, it's not necessarily democracy itself that causes the tyranny, but it's a certain way of thinking about freedom and equality that gets us to create an environment in which a tyrant can rule. I'll say a little bit more about that. So back to the hypothesis question, thesis. Um, so there it's formulated in a question. Does Hayek, so I'm now connecting those two talks to what I'm talking about now. Does Hayek's thinking represent the real road to serfdom? And here again, the idea is that Hayek is a father, one of the key proponents of neoliberal thinking. And so if you just reformulate it, does the spread of neoliberalism or neoliberal ideas prepare the way for the conditions of authoritarian rule? Again, when I was talking about the loss of a particular sort of freedom, that freedom being a kind of political freedom and authoritarianism being the condition in which you've lost that freedom. You no longer have a say uh, in your government. And so that's the question. Here's a subthesis, and this is kind of maybe the core. My, my argument will be bigger than this. But here's the idea in relation to Plato. Neoliberalism understands freedom and equality in a way that prepares the conditions for authoritarian rule. Freedom as the idea of the ability to do what one wants. And the key notion there is that we'll be disconnected from forms of self-governance uh, in the political sphere and also notions of responsibility. So the ability to just do what I want, of course, if you come and say, well, you have a responsibility to do X, Y, and Z, well, that stands in tension with my ability to just do what you want. Of course, we all know this when we're raising children. You have a responsibility to do X, but I really want to do Y. Um, they feel that and that's frustrating. The equality is a little more tricky, um, but what it's doing is undermining, and the concern about neoliberalism, it undermines 
the distinction that we might have between individuals that are advancing their own self-interests and individuals that are committed to something like the public good, the common good, uh, service, serving others. And that's, that loss of that distinction for me is a real concern. I simply don't think that you can have um, a democratic society without a robust kind of sense, uh, a, a significant number of people who are committed to notions of the common good and, and willing to kind of go beyond themselves. That's a controversial claim, uh, but that's my concern and my view. How are we doing? <laughs> Let me uh, actually get a little water. So what is neoliberalism? There's a simple answer. Um, it is a form of liberalism, um, which, well, liberalism's all over the place if you look at the term, who are liberals, um, especially when it was, the term kind of changed its me meaning significantly in the early part of the 20th century. Um, but, and I'm, we can talk about that. Uh, hopefully I'm kind of informed enough to have a conversation about that as well, because it's really complex and deep. But I'll just say this, um, liberalism, what it does is it makes freedom a central value. Um, so to be a liberal is to think freedom is really important. Uh, the second thing that it says, uh, this is controversial. If I go on my Stanford Encyclopedia to Philosophy, I'll actually find that I'm just cherry picking one meaning because there's a bunch of, well, okay, freedom is really important, but how do you understand that? That's actually a debate. But I'm going to say that kind of the central meaning here, it's from John Stuart Mill, who was associated or is, well, it can be understood as a liberal, pursuing our own good in our own way. So again, this kind of freeing to some degree from the restraints of the community and kind of shaping one's own existence independently of those demands. Freedom here, and then I'm moving into kind of some classical accounts is created then by limiting the sphere of government control. So where the government is, freedom is not. And now if you think about that, if that's how you understand freedom and you make freedom a fundamental value, I mean, what follows about the size of the government? You want, you want to restrict it, if that's the case. What it also does is oftentimes in the classical accounts, we'll establish and protect uh, property rights. So oftentimes we kind of understand uh, uh, the protection of property very important. And then what this does, the combination of kind of freedom to kind of shape your own existence along with property rights becomes the basis for a free market e economy and so capitalism. So there you are, you have your property, you have your freedom to do what you want. You find that you need to eat, uh, clo get clothing, shelter, things like this, take care of the family. So what do you do? You in enter into non-coercive relations with other human beings in order to say, I'll make this for you, you make that for me, and we'll trade and exchange. In fact, I'll specialize in this area, you specialize in that area, we'll come together and produce a pencil. Um, which is true, there's stories in the thinkers that I study, of course, um, will very much emphasize the, the amount of different specializations that go on uh, in producing just something as simple as a pencil. Um, so here's the thing that we need to do. So neo, new, we're distinguishing that with classical liberalism. And there's a bunch, you could probably throw, you know, human here, there's, there's a number of other thinkers. John Locke, Adam Smith are tended, uh, typically thought of as classical liberals. Not just thought of, I would say they are. What neoliberalism, here's the difference. Neoliberalism allows government to plan for market competition. It's not laissez-faire. And so one of the things when there was kind of uh, liberalism in the 19th century, just let everything, the, the kind of market take over everything, no government um, interference whatsoever. Uh, this is actually something I picked out of Hayek. Some of these theses could be controversial, but the idea is no, actually we want government to be in some sense involved in the market, but what they should be doing if they're planning at all is not planning how many kind of, uh, how much corn or how much food we should be producing, but planning for competition, creating conditions of a market to let the market do its thing. What it does, and this is a point made by Wendy Brown, and I think it's uh, true, you can kind of document it. Uh, it extends market thinking beyond the market itself. Uh, perhaps even Wendy Brown, who's out uh, at Berkeley, wrote a book called Undoing the Demos. We begin seeing ourselves both as capital and kind of entrepreneurs. 
uh, even dating relationships, we talk about a marketplace, right? Um, and so the idea of the, the neoliberals is to take kind of basic market mechanisms and apply them to spheres that hitherto had been kind of divorced or separate from uh, market thinking. It also purges classical liberalism, and this is one big point. If you read the classical liberals, they'll also use language that commits them to notions of the public or the common good. What they effectively do, the neoliberals, is put constraints on, downplay, even uh, you get cases of somebody like Ayn Rand calling the common good evil, right? That's, that's, she's not necessarily a, a, a neoliberal, uh, but in that kind of tradition, and I'll say why. What they also do is reject the classical claim, the classical liberal claim that all human beings are created equal. They really gut any robust conception of equality. Of course, if you think about, can anyone, I mean, can you think about why? If you say that all human beings are created equal, that might, if you run that logic to its extreme in a way, what kind of government you might get from putting a heavy emphasis on communism. So what they do is they, there's, of course there's middle positions, but what they do is they kind of gut that concept and they say equality just means equality before the law, um, which is also interesting to think about in political terms. Uh, where I got this idea, I actually kind of came upon it in just preparing for this week. I went out and bought, here's a thinker, and I'll talk about just in a second, here's another thinker that's associated with the neoliberal movement, Ludwig von Mises. Um, he says, and so I went out and bought his book called Liberalism, which when it was first translated into English wasn't translated, Liberalismus is the German, wasn't translated as liberalism because that term had been appropriated by proponents of people like the New Deal and things like this, and so it didn't make any sense, and so they gave it a different title, but now they said, no, no, we're liberals. Anyway, here's what he says. Nowhere is the difference between the reasonings of the older liberals and then that of neoliberals and clearer and easier to demonstrate than in their treatment of the problem, and notice it's a problem, uh, of equality. The liberals of the 18th century, guided by the idea of natural law and of the enlightenment, demanded for everyone equality of political and civil rights because they assume that all men are created equal. Nothing, however, is as ill-founded as the assertion of the alleged equality of all members of the human race. So that's one of the stronger statements I've found. I think if you were to look at somebody like a Milton Friedman, who's also part of this, um, you'll find um, uh, much more tempered language. Um, he does have a nice interesting chapter on equality and what that means. Uh, but here's a real strong statement uh, of the position. And I don't think it's foreign, uh, the spirit of that is foreign to the other thinkers. Some more background on neoliberalism. Um, the sources of neoliberalism are both American and European. I have to say, well, let me say it in a little bit. Well, I'll say it right now. I, ha I have to say what excites me about this uh, is the significance of ideas and the way in which certain ideas were formulated uh, around in the 30s and the 40s and the way in which after about 50 years they were put into uh, practical policy. So you see, so a lot of times we're in some sense philosophers are under assault about what's the point of what you're doing, what's the relevance. Well, you don't see immediate relevance, but if certain ideas take hold, they're incredibly relevant. And I think that that's what's happened. Um, so just some people, Walter Littmann's The Good Society, it's a book that I would uh, check out. He wrote that in 37. Um, and also the Austrian School of Economics, Ludwig von Mises, Karl uh, Menger are some names associated um, with this movement. And what Littmann's book did was the fo uh, formed the transatlantic Mont Pelerin Society. And this is a society where people like um, Hayek and um, Friedman would meet on a regular basis in Switzerland. The two most important neoliberals, there we go, in my view, I mean, this is certainly, this is the people that I read the most and know more and more about, I would say, Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman. So Hayek is Austrian, spending time at working to some degree at Chicago, also London School of Economics. Milton Friedman, of course, finds his home in Chicago. There are some, some texts, The Road to Serfdom, The Constitution of Liberty, Capitalism, Friedman, Freedom, and Free to Choose um, are some texts. Here's the argument of the road to serfdom. So back to my thesis. 
It's a reaction to Fabian socialism. Uh, Fabian socialists wanted simply kind of to progressively move us towards democratic socialism or even communism, not through a violent revolution, but through democratic peaceful means. You simply take one policy after another. If you can get them with social security, you can get them with health care, then you can get them with redistributing income. So the, on down the road, and then you do have a fully kind of socialist society. Um, Hayek's argument, and to some degree that set frames and allows Hayek to make precisely that point. Don't you see if you accept something like national health care, then you're on the road to this form of government. But it was interpreted when it made its way over uh, through the Reader's Digest um, as rejecting and re as a reaction to the FDR's New Deal. Um, and uh, the claim of Hayek's uh, book is that it's not failed capitalism that leads to totalitarian rule of the sort that emerged in Europe in the first half of the 20th century. To some degree, I'm making a version of that claim here or suggesting it. Uh, instead, it's the gradual erosion of freedoms uh, through an ever-expanding sphere of government control and interference in the free market. So it's not capitalism that leads to the horrors of the 20th century. It's actually healthcare. Um, well, that, that <laughs> yeah. Hayek's argument was the basis for this billboard in Iowa that was, I think, taken down, put up by the Tea Party. Right. The idea is you have Obama being associated with the horrors of the 20th century precisely because the logic that's being kind of unfolded with those kinds of, especially the individual mandate forcing people to buy health care is opening the door to forcing people to do other things, and then now you're trapped, right? Uh, of course, then you have live free or die, <laughs> right? Freedom. Anyway, yeah, so I missed this. I got really excited and jumped to the next slide. <laughs> 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 Here's the argument. Every compromise, well, uh, this is one summary or kind of based on a summary. Every compromise of human freedom for the sake of justice or the common good is a step toward dictatorship. You have foolish people who hear things like uh, social justice, common good, fairness, things like that, and they buy into certain policies that then demand, in order for those policies to be executed, more government control over the affairs of the lives of people, and pretty soon the government is in your business in every possible sphere. And if that's the case, then you've lost freedom. And of course, losing, you'd rather be dead than losing freedom, because freedom is a central value. That's the idea. The influence of neoliberalism, here's my, the exciting thing, and so you, I, I have to say that there's certainly people here in the audience that know better about the history than I do. I'm educating myself as we go. Uh, in the United States, I'm just a philosopher. Uh, <laughs> uh, Barry Goldwater's campaign bears the markers of neoliberalism. Uh, Milton Friedman uh, was his economic advisor, or at least somebody who was close enough to Friedman to write an op-ed in, I think, 1964 in the New York Times, explaining what kind of uh, Goldwater's economic policies were. Of course, Ronald Reagan was associated with that campaign, and while Friedman seemed like a, I mean, not Friedman, Goldwater seemed like a real nut, as far as I have been told through my studies of history uh, at the time, uh, the Reagan, when Reagan came onto the scene, um, also combining, it's important, this kind of way of thinking with a kind of conservatism about social issues and also a real hawkishness in, in, um, in national defense. Um, uh, the revolution, and here's, the, here's a book, another one you might be interested in, Masters of the Universe, if you're interested in reading more about that. You have the pictures of Hayek, Friedman, Thatcher, and Reagan. And it's, it's fascinating to see the parallels between the US and the UK and the way they, they, they move uh, with respect to this um, way of thinking. Examples of Reagan's neoliberalism, tax cuts, what, 81, 86. You have the highest income tax going from 70% to 50%, and then from 50% down to 30. They cut it in half within six years, as far as I understand it, uh, the top uh, uh, tax bracket rate. Um, uh, union busting, uh, air traffic controller strike, I think was a major movement that scared a lot of unions. Uh, deregulation, sale of public land, uh, things like that. Uh, part two, this is also important. Neoliberalism shaped the politics of the so-called left. So we're not just up here. If we are uncomfortable with neoliberalism, we're not just up here kind of pointing fingers at a certain party. 
The claim is that this way of thinking, which was considered in a certain formulation quite odd, um, even nutty in 64, came to take over such that we get um, the Democrats, like Bill Clinton, the new Democrats, adopting this kind of way of thinking and then uh, melding it with um, certain policies, especially on kind of social issues. So the claim is that Bill Clinton is every, much, every bit as much a neoliberal uh, as somebody like Ronald Reagan. I don't know if that's true, but people will make that claim, especially from people from kind of the Sanders wing um, uh, now. For example, welfare reform, NAFTA, uh, Glass-Steagall, deregulation of financial markets, things like that. Um, and you had Tony Blair. Again, the parallel striking. Tony Blair comes along and does the same thing, the third way. My you know, concern to some degree is the way in which that shifted the center. I mean, the power of the Reagan revolution is that we now say, well, the, it's not just if you win an election or win a debate, it's that you shift the terms of the debate. So it's that you now see, well, you get this option or that option. But both of those options, and the argument goes, kind of operate largely within this kind of framework. Critics of the left will also make that claim about Barack Obama. Uh, usually the line is the way he talked during the political campaigns was not the language of neoliberalism, but more of democracy and citizenship. But when he actually, when push came to shove in terms of governing, he retreated back to kind of this way of thinking. That's the claim. I'm not necessarily saying it's true. I'm just saying I think it's true that this way of thinking has come to really uh, dominate uh, our political landscape until, of course, and again, the parallel is really neat in a way, I don't know, uh, the presidential election in 2016. When you saw, in some sense, if you just take Sanders, Clinton, Trump, and seeing really actually Clinton as being the proponent of kind of neoliberalism, and Trump and Sanders as two different responses to it, uh, as well as Brexit um, uh, moving away from this framework. Neoliberalism is this. So here's my thesis. So that's some background. There's the history. There's no fundamental. Okay, what I'm going to do is give you seven of these. I'm going to back up. There's seven. <laughs> um, uh, and then I'm going to go through them in a little bit of detail. Um, I'm going to almost spin out a story in much the same way. Sometimes when I read The Road to Serfdom of Hayek, I'm like, he's just kind of telling us stories. Don't you see this happens, and then people get lazy, and then they don't want to work, and don't you see how it all fits together, and then all of a sudden we have Hitler. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that to some degree I might be doing that, but here's some logic. For the neoliberals, there's no fundamental commitment to democracy and so political freedom. freedom. They are committed and will talk the language of democracy being important, especially someone like Milton Friedman, but it won't be fundamental. Fundamental is the private sphere of freedom that it forms the basis for capital, capitalist free market exchange. It rejects openly notions of the common good, social justice, things like that, for reasons I'll talk about and mentioned before. Here's my biggest concern. These go hand in hand. It's about what it does to us as people. It strips away, therefore, the demand upon us or people who adopt this framework from having any deep commitments, especially for the real diehard kind of neoliberals, to the common good and the project called democracy. We don't have any, we have rights, but we really don't have responsibilities, especially to others. We will have responsibilities, of course, to ourselves if we want to survive. And in a lot of the literature, what you're getting is that we, oh, that should have been changed. Oh, well, that's okay. It conceives of the individual as self-interested. I will put utility maximizers, not preference maximizers. You maximize the satisfaction of preferences. Um, but what you're really out for is you have a series of preferences. You want stuff, and what you do is you go out and get the things that you want, and that's life. And then you die. So <laughs> um, there's not much more to it. This kind of way of thinking creates a world of, uh, allows for and even creates a world of economic winners and losers. This creates uh, kind of an oligarchy in which the economic winners take control of the government and the so-called losers get angry, Anger's look for a scapegoat, anger is manipulated, and there you go, you have serfdom. So technically my talk is done right now, uh, <laughs> if you just uh, <laughs> agree with this. Uh, but I have to show you a video too, so I'm going to sneak that, that in as well. Uh, here's the most fascinating thing, and there's a lot of talk about this. 
that I feel like I discovered, but people knew this who are smarter and more educated on these topics than me. I was shocked. Oh gosh, oh well, I'm jumping. Anyway, I'll tell you what I was shocked about in a little bit. Fukuyama, Francis Fukuyama said we've got this thing when the communism came down at 89, 90. Um, it, when he said this, I think maybe 89, liberal democracy was the end of history. We've got it. We've figured out the form of government. Now there might be certain countries in which that doesn't, isn't fully realized, but this is the form of government to which we're committed. There's no longer any reason. And of course, this is a bit of a caricature and he's responded to this, but that's the way most people understood what he was saying. Liberal democracy is the, the way to go. However, if you think about it, there's no necessary connection. And this is some of a book by a young person named uh, Yasha Monk. Uh, it's more than just him because we have uh, uh, the concept of ill. There's no necessary connection between liberalism and democracy. Oftentimes, liberals will be Democrats, and Democrats will be liberals. In other words, um, uh, but they're not necessarily kind of joined. Democracy is about who governs. Yeah, good. So I'm explaining why this is the case. Democracy is about who governs and how we govern. It's about how we make decisions. It is by the people. So it's talking about insofar as there's government, how do we kind of conduct that government? How do we go about making decisions at the governmental level? Liberalism, for the most part, at least this form of liberal, especially the kind of neoliberal form, is about rights that limit the scope of government. So, and you can understand this by understanding the flip side. For the opposite of democracy is a form of authoritarianism, where a certain group of people say what we're going to do, and the other people, you're a good subject when you just obey, just like at home. A good kid is when you obey. Right, Sebastian? Yeah, okay, there we go. Uh, <laughs> liberalism is about the rights that limit the scope of government, how big government is. And so the opposite of liberalism is therefore a form of totalitarianism. In other words, the government can be involved in all spheres of your life. It's totalizing. So here's the idea. There's no theoretical incompatibility between liberalism and authoritarianism. You could be a liberal who promotes authoritarianism. Indeed, if we go to neoliberalism, this is the shocking part. There is no fundamental commitment to democracy. In fact, here's Hayek, and this is when I read it in Hayek, I was like, oh, that, that's, I get it. Government is an instrument created to protect private freedom and property. It's there to secure your rights. And here's what he says, democracy is essentially a means, a utilitarian device for safeguarding internal peace and individual freedom. We must not forget that there has often been much more cultural and spiritual freedom under autocratic rule than under some democracies. In other words, if democracy starts getting into your business, it'd be a lot better to live under an authoritarian rule. That's what that says to me. That was shocking. Um, the question is, if democracy starts engaging in or enacting policies that do that, what do you do with a tool that doesn't work? Throw it away. Uh, the historical event that exhibited this tension, um, this is a documentary, Chicago Boys, that's about what went on in Chile. I believe on, I think there was a coup in September 11th, is that right? It's 1973, um, where a democratically elected socialist came into power an authoritarian by the name of Pinochet overthrew him. And there's always talk of the way in which kind of neoliberals of the Chicago boys related to people like Milton Friedman kind of supported that authoritarian regime, saying it's more important to get economic freedom off the ground and to secure those economic rights than it is to allow a democratically elected socialist uh, to be in power. It's not to say the Chicago boys were there um, enacting the coup. That's a whole matter of debate and how much America had a role in that. It's an interesting point, but it is just kind of a flashpoint that exhibits where are your priorities. Is capitalism more important than democracy when they conflict? Here's another book that just came out about two years ago. It's a professor at Georgetown. He comes out of uh, the kind of a libertarian way of thinking, mode of thinking, and he makes precisely this point. If you can find a government, democracy is simply a tool. If you can find a form of government that does a better job, then we should promote that form of government. A crude kind of version of the argument that is pr presented here 
is that one way to improve our decision making is not to allow uninformed, uneducated people to vote. So you strip them of their political rights, namely the right uh, to vote and the right to run for office. And my point is, is that it just comes out of once you buy into this framework, you're going to start thinking about you don't have any essential commitment to democracy. And in fact, we have a book out by Nancy McLean in history talking about the way uh, other, a certain proponent, James Buchanan, that's kind of in this milieu, uh, used a certain form of thinking to put chains on democracy. So in other words, she's coming from the presuppos presupposition that democracy is really important. And this kind of thinking put chains on democracy. The second thing is the common good is evil. I guess I have it up there. That's a really extreme formulation, but can lead to evil. Neoliberalism is openly hostile to the common good. The root of the hostility, I've already said this, notions like welfare, general welfare, the common good can be used to justify policies that coerce individuals and destroy freedom. You have to buy health care, right? Ayn Rand, this is kind of another person in this milieu, kind of says this makes us into sacrificial animals. So you get this common good, now your job is to serve the common good, not serve yourself, right? You're living your lives for others. And the arguments, here are their arguments. As far as I found, there are probably more. This is kind of a superficial. Individuals have radically different preferences. So whenever you're doing something like the common good, somebody's going to be really unhappy because we just differ on the kinds of preferences that we have. And the second thing, and this is a point made by Hayek, uh, kind of an epistemic humility. You want to kind of organize things according to the common good in the government. Well, what is that? And part of that has to do with the kind of significant differences that we have about what we think is good. Maybe people just prefer to live without health care. It's kind of fun. It makes life exciting. You don't know what's going to happen the next day. It's true. I'm sure that there is at least one person in our country who says, yes, I would prefer to just kind of live life without health care. Um, what this does is leads to, because you downplay those elements, political liberty is non-essential and the public good is rejected. Individuals are free from responsibility attending these things. Adam Carolla is a libertarian and comedian. He's got some language that I kind of beeped out. Um, here's the idea of what America is about without any sense of like, I have a responsibility to go vote. Uh, my feeling is that this whole country is founded on the principle, if you're not hurting anyone and you're not you know, doing something when someone else's stuff, uh, <laughs> and you are paying your taxes, you should be able to just do whatever you want, right? It's the freedom and the independence. And the idea that I'm suggesting, it's a freedom from kind of some sense of moral responsibility and concern for things like democracy and the common good. Of course, as I mentioned, neoliberalism does have an ethical responsibility and you'll get this in some of Hayek's writings like the Constitution of Liberty, personal responsibility. You are responsible for yourself. If you do that, you're a good citizen because then I don't have to, of course, be responsible for you. Um, Furthermore, once you start undermining those things or, or, or kind of downplaying the significance of democracy and the common good, uh, tax dollars, um, uh, you become resistant to uh, taxation that support the infrastructure for things like democracy and the public good. Education, public education, education with a civic purpose all lose their funding. Public television and radio as a form of continuing civic education starts to get under attack and lose your funding. If people like it, they'll support it in the free market. If they don't, uh, why use government taxes to support this? Uh, National endowments for the arts and humanities. Public libraries, the argument I think this summer on Forbes, but then was taken down is that public libraries perhaps should just be best replaced with Amazon bookshops. Um, there was a response to that, I think, in the New York Times last week. And of course, Time just came out with uh, the fact that our teachers are uh, badly underpaid. Um, to some degree, my suggestion is that this is a result of kind of this way of thinking. Now, I think I should be wary of time, probably. Is that? I'm, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna miss a video. I, we're gonna, if you wanna play it during Q&A, about five minutes. Not, not the video, no, we have to go past the video. I think we're gonna move on, because if we play the video and the other stuff, then we're up to 10. Um, so, we're down to five now, so. <laughs> um, here's the most concerning point, and here are the three folks, Friedman, Becker, Buchanan, all take this notion of being self-interested, kind of utility maximizer, 
and kind of embedded within our thinking. Homo economicus is the, the argument uh, or the, the way that we kind of think of ourselves and we think of ourselves not just in economics that way uh, but uh, in all aspects of life. Trying to tease this out, this is probably the one that I'm kind of not, again, have the most problem, but James Buchanan was the person that Nancy McLean talks about. It's public choice theory, and, and I, I'm, I'm worried, and I'm probably I'm caricaturing it a little bit, but the idea is that let's take this self-interested thinking and apply it to explain um, the way in which politicians behave. And it's true that they operate in, in, in self-interested ways. But the worry is that if you just say, well, s politicians are just going to be, or at least supposed to be, it's between the is and the ought, um, these self-interested characters, that's just the way things work, you kind of undermine the idea that um, politicians at least ought to be, and at the end of their lives, we kind of praise them for their service and sacrifice. So it eliminates this kind of genuine notion of, of sacrifice and moral praise. So it undermines any distinction between excessively self-serving politicians on the one hand, and folks that um, have, have done something for uh, the larger good. This is kind of stuff that I've covered before and probably can finish up in about um, three minutes. Market of self-interested individuals creates a high stakes rat race. The idea is one of the concerns is that economic, um, free market economics of course leads to inequalities. Thomas Piketty kind of points that out not too long ago. Produces big payoff for the winners coupled with a form of, of understanding of freedom that kind of rolls back uh, safety nets and, and um, things that protect us from falling into an economic abyss. What you do is get individuals really afraid and they begin focusing on self-advancement and less and less on public things, public matters, because you have to be really worried about yourself because if you don't, somebody's gonna beat you. When these individuals turn to politics, they do so with personal interest in mind. This is, the idea is that if you really become focused on just advancing yourself, if you go into the political sphere, you're going to start engaging in behavior that's going to shape laws, not necessarily, again, for the public good, but for your own benefit. What this does is that these economic inequalities are then used or translate into political inequalities. There's the meta issue in which you use money in order to ensure that money can have an influence on politics, manipulating and changing campaign finance laws or having them struck down in certain cases. And then through the influence of money in politics, donors can set the agenda and get the decisions they want passed. This is in Robert Reich talks a lot about this. Economic inequality leads to political inequality. You shape the political system to further enhance your economic inequality. It becomes kind of a vicious circle. And this is the kind of disputed claim of Gillens and Page from 2014 that we live in a de facto oligarchy. Economic elites and interest groups can shape US government policy, but Americans who are less well off have essentially no influence over what their government does. That was the statistical analysis that they ran. Again, there are people who are criticizing it, but you can read up on it if you want. A de facto oligarchy is already a form of serfdom. If you're not an elite who sets the agenda, you effectively live by rules over which you have, the non-elite live by rules over which you have no control. You've lost, in some sense, political effectiveness, agency. In this sense, we're subjects. Of course, we still have the right to vote. And as we've seen, uh, people can kind of fight the money in politics. And if they kind of come together, uh, 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 choose folks who will respond differently to that. The simple, the threat, the worry is, and I've said this before, this creates the animosity toward the elite classes and government itself. Because you really sense that you have no control, you begin to just hate government itself. This hatred and animosity can be manipulated by a savvy authoritarian. <laughs> the, sca <sorry. laughs> the, the scapegoating, right? Um, that finally, in the end, and I, you know, this is the worry that that savvy authoritarian and savvy is probably the word, <laughs> the word. Um, you strip both political and personal freedoms, right? And this way, neoliberalism may be the real road to serfdom. And I just have one more slide. <laughs> one thing I promised to do, but I won't, and I just realized this is just going on, um, exploring the alternatives. I think that was in the little blurb we're gonna talk about to do. One might infer, so the classical debate that this emerges out of is, well, if you're not a liberal, then you're a socialist, right? Um, is a better alternative to liberalism. 
said I was going to argue that um, liberals should consider becoming Republicans. <laughs> we can talk, I'll leave that there. <laughs> this will have to be for some other time, perhaps part four. Um, <laughs> and the questions, um, I'll now open it up. I guess the real question, it's just a question. Is this kind of the road to serfdom? Is it something else? I think one of the burning things, if it is, what's the better alternative? Is there, is there one? That's the worrisome thing. Like, what do we do if this framework doesn't work? So with that, I'll end and say uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> Let's talk. May I, yeah. um, may I ask, in what context are you using the term democracy? Is it a pure democracy, a moderate democracy, or our system of democracy, yeah. which is a Republican form of government? All of those or none of those? Yeah, so um, in this context, <laughs> I, because I haven't defined it, I almost want to say, well, in some sense, all of those, we have to then define it. I can tell you the way that I understand, I mean, I prefer representative democracy. I also think that when we're talking about certain kind of distinctions among people, between people who are conceive of themselves as public servants and people who don't conceive of themselves as public servants, that what we're doing in democracy is trying to identify especially those people, especially those people who might also have some knowledge or understanding and, and put those into office. But the way I understand democracy, and actually you mentioned it, uh, you know, when I'm, that's, that liberals maybe should think about becoming Republicans. Um, a government of, by, and for the people. If you just take that kind of concept and break it down in certain ways that may not be totally historically accurate, of meaning that in some sense it comes from people, they provide the legitimacy and authority to the government to do the things it wants it to do. Um, for the people simply means it's not a corrupt government. Then when it's making laws, it's doing so for the, the good of the people, uh, not for the rulers themselves. And by means that we effectively have to participate in the process of shaping ourselves. So another way of thinking of democracy is collective self-governance. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, quick comment and question. Oh, when you used Glenn Beck, mm -hmm. uh, you, as you probably know, he, were, he was really channeling Ronald Reagan in 1964. Uh, when he cut a record for the AMA talking about if Medicare was passed, mm -hmm. that it would be on the slippery slope to socialism and communism. I, so, uh, in other words, the argument was already being made yeah. by Reagan in 1964. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I, I kind of observed is uh, with all these writings uh, that uh, the neoliberal side, or however you want to uh, look at it, um, is uh, uses communication uh, and its ability to capture uh, different aspects of communication, writing books, uh, now with Fox News and, and things like that, to help set the debate and to define the terms. And, um, you know, uh, I, I was just kind of wondering, uh, number one is, uh, use the term free market, but I'm not sure that there ever is a pure free market. And that the what is a pure free market? Well, I, I'm not sure there is a pure free market. Well, that's, in, yeah. In many things, so that they use that to cover up a lot of, a lot of the, uh, the faults of society. Uh, I've often, often used the term corporate socialism, the way that, uh, you, I think you've talked about capturing the government to use it to yes. enhance economic growth. And, um, um, alternative facts that sometimes get worked work into the debate that they, they peruse. Yeah. And, and lastly, I, I would ask you, uh, we being here at a Catholic university, where does morality fit into any of this? Uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of things, and I'm slowly losing the initial points. But I mean, I'll start with the, the last uh, point. That's absolutely the upshot. It's undermining kind of, I would say, some moral capital. And the idea is that a liberal democracy, is, or even the kind of just liberal capitalism, in some sense has worked because it was combined with non kind of uh, a kind of social capital or a mentality that was inherited from previous um, times in which we didn't um, conceive of ourselves as um, 
uh, self-interested utility maximizers. So in other words, there's kind of built into us a sense of respect for kind of equal rights, equality, the common good, a sense of fairness, um, and that this way of thinking is eroding that. So is it Martin Shkreli? Is that the pronunciation of the last name? So this comes out of, of uh, Robert Reich has made this point that you start producing individuals who just have a laser-like focus on their own individual um, preferences and the satisfaction of those preferences, such that if you buy a drug company, you're willing to just kind of point to free market logic to say that I can inflate those prices even if uh, individuals suffer from that. That's just the way things work. Um, to go back, uh, maybe, yeah. The use of communication and the uh, definitions of free market or the use of the term corporate socialism. Yeah, so another point that, of course, uh, Robert Reich will make is that these folks are very much going to be of the, well, mindset. They'll be close to that camp that there is some kind of notion of property independent of government. There, there can be markets independent of government. And what the government is there to do is simply to um, protect uh, what's kind of naturally there. Uh, there's a little bit of a tweak. I mean, we saw Friedman, or not Friedman, but Hayek saying in some sense we need the government to plan for, for competition. But that's a big debate. So if we're planning for competition, the question is, what are the rules that we put in place and who do those favor? Um, so Reich has a book called Saving Capitalism. And the underlying idea behind saving capitalism is that it's not that we just want to get rid of it. It's just we need to reshape the rules around which or within which or by which capitalism runs. In terms of communications, maybe I'll say a little tangential point. Um, there's the called the, the, the Fairness Doctrine of the F FCC in eight, 1987. Um, I haven't been able to kind of dig into it enough, uh, but what gave rise to a lot of the politically divisive kind of um, networks that we now have, you could say that's both from the right and the left, was that the FCC no longer requires um, networks to kind of give balanced uh, accounts uh, from both sides, devote equal time to kind of controversial issues. And I think the reasoning behind that led to that decision was the claim that no, the FCC should be involved in protecting democracy and the common good. And the argument against that was no, we need to let communications run according to free market principles. As far as I understand it, the fear actually from some Republicans was at the time was that if you do that, then all the liberal media will take over um, and have their own special channels. But, but that's maybe just kind of tangential to kind of your question, but yeah. It seems that the founders and Abraham Lincoln uh, set a tone uh, for character and the public good, and uh, that uh, the idea of having a large government uh, that has a lot of uh, things to do, you know, like build public roads and have other public things that I think most people, whatever political persuasion would like or even demand, uh, that seemed to be a defining uh, part of who we are. And, and uh, Abraham Lincoln questioned whether such a company, such a government could endure. And uh, many of us hope that it can endure. Uh, so I just wondered if you think that's really um, in, uh, you know, well, so I think the way to, I'm finding how many slides I have up here. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to go back to the equality one. But let's just put it, that's exactly, if I can get up Mises's, there we go. This was striking when I read it. I mean, about nothing, however, is ill founded as the assertion of the alleged equality of the members of the human race. Um, what I mean by that is this. I think that what this tradition of thinking has done is taken certain elements that can be found in our founding documents, constitution being really important for that, and taking those elements and making them the utmost significance, sh shedding, downplaying, demoting other elements that were incredibly important, like Lincoln's speech, government of, by, and for the people. And really the claim of the talk is that if you do that, if you just take personal freedom, divorce it from sense of responsibility, 
which of course was there in the, the founding kind of discussions, documents, things like this, you're going to lead to a condition in which government of, by, and for the people is under threat and may even perish. That, that's the claim of the talk. Um, and I think the idea is not, again, to overthrow this idea that personal liberal, liberty and say that that's not important either, because I, I certainly wouldn't want to live in a country where the government just tells me what my future occupation is going to be. I think that'd be awful, quite frankly. I don't want that. But I think there's more to who we are than just that, than just markets, than just kind of the protection of private property. And I think that's the kind of idea of, and recapturing notions of the common good and, and civic responsibility. Yeah. Uh, I forget how I learned this, but um, just like um, Greenspan saw the light or the road mm -hmm. to air, mm -hmm. all the managers at Lehman Brothers were going to be uh, civic even minded and self regulate. Yeah. When what Beck uh, said that he always saw a threat to democracy and freedom from the left. Yeah. But recently he realizes it's from the right. And he brought up a dude from Russia, Alexander Dugan, I think his name mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess they had a party in Moscow with Putin's picture and Le Pen and Trump. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Dugan ran the thing. Yeah, let's, it, 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 oh, I haven't let you no, ask your no. question, yeah. <laughs> um, I, well, I have, uh, who was the lady at Berkeley? Wendy Brown, Undoing the Demos. Um, and the no health care idea. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was uh, the infamous dad, Rand Paul, mm -hmm. when asked what would happen to somebody who had no health care. Mm -hmm. And I think he gave an answer, well, they die. Yeah. I don't know if he said that, but that, well, I yeah. Came close. Well, yes, that, that, that's the underlying idea because forcing people, well, live free or die. Right. <laughs> forcing people to participate in the system for notions of the common good to protect people that haven't been responsible enough for themselves to right. secure the conditions for having health insurance. That's the, I, I think that they would probably wouldn't pushed on it. That's the price of freedom. I don't think that's wholly unfair, especially when you move from kind of, there's differences between neoliberals and libertarianism, but I think that's, that's what they would say. Now, that doesn't preclude somebody of their own good will, freely acting, not being coerced, to go and help them, offer them charities. That they are very much uh, in support of that because it's non-coercive, yeah. right? So, so that's another thing is that maybe they wouldn't die. Maybe you'd have charities come in to, and, well, to help the them. the underlying current is we all pay for that anyway. Uh, by our healthcare premiums, they yeah. get, unless you want to go down that road and say, yes. well, if they show up at the emergency room, the door gets locked. And yep. Let me go back just to the first point. Pick up your body. Let's just go to the first point. It, what should be clear is not that neoliberals are in favor of uh, uh, necessarily kind of promoting uh, strongmen. Um, that do th that kind of defend notions of like economic nationalism. That that's not the claim. It's the claim just as. Uh, uh, things like Barack Obama and the Affordable Health Care Act, it's not that he's out there promoting kind of uh, socialism or even communism where everybody's equal. It's that this is an unintended consequence. That's the same argument that, and, and so neoliberals, and you see this actually with the Koch brothers, I think they can be placed in that camp too roughly, are responding with, by, in principle to our current president and, and breaking with him, which they should. They should be really worried about this because this is the very kind of concern um, that, that animated Hayek as well. So, yeah. Matt. Yeah, hi. Denise. Okay, Matt. Yeah. Okay. Um, what prevents, I mean, what if, what if you look at it another way? What if our government said to us, uh, healthcare is too important to leave it to piecemeal, uh, uh, plans and insurance companies deciding what's good for you. Mm -hmm. And we're going to provide uh, excellent health care for all of our citizens. Mm -hmm. You don't have to participate. Mm -hmm. It's up to you mm -hmm. if you want to participate. Mm -hmm. But then we're not losing individual freedoms. Yes. And we're having what's necessary for our 
government, and we're, we're fulfilling a civic responsibility. Yeah. So there, there you'd find much less opposition from this group. And actually, if you read Hayek, and I still have to look into this a little bit more, he says there's nothing wrong with providing, for the government providing kind of base level kind of care for really uh, people in really difficult situations, which could include, you know, uh, welfare programs and uh, basic health care. Uh, so. I'm not even thinking about basic health care. I'm thinking, you know, what you could get in, in many in <coughs> European countries. Yes. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm thinking of health care yeah. as, you know, instead of attaching it to how much you can afford to pay yeah. or what insurance companies will allow you to have. Yeah. I'm just thinking of it as, you know, what what would be what would be probably less burdensome yeah. on us as a country financially, yeah. uh, but giving giving us a good outcome. Yeah, yeah. So to go back, if you're not coercing individual from this perspective, they'd find it much less problematic. Um, but they would still be concerned about, again, the government intrusion or entry into the marketplace. Some of them find that kind of um, as, as an instrumental point. They just think markets work better. That's one claim. Some of it, it's principled. No, there really is this intrusion taking away something that I value so much and that the government should just be out of it. It depends on you know, the version that you're finding. But the really strong opposition can come from this idea of the individual mandate. And that's when you get signs from kind of Tea Party. And that's not necessarily neoliberal. It's almost moving into neo uh, libertarian territory. But they get really worried about the government to be able to do that um, in, in all spheres then. It sets a precedent is the idea. The end of for profit health care. And that's our big problem. We have for profit health care. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, interesting talk. I was a little bit confused. You mentioned uh, Hillary Clinton as the neoliberal. Yes and Sanders and Trump as a reaction to that. Yeah. So who's the neoliberal liberal? because it seems like the Trump administration's policies are the neoliberal policies that you're talking about. So, so who's the neoliberal? Well, Trump's kind of, as we know, I, all over the, the place. But the typical way of, of thinking is that, at least from, uh, periodicals like the, the Guardian is, I mean, there's a claim there that what got Trump elected, what caused Hillary to loss was her husband. And that had to do with his particular policies that he enacted. That it's a continued mode of thinking that sees uh, goodness in, in, in free markets, uh, that almost has a principle and commitment, free trade. Uh, Trump, no, so if you think of tax cuts, what we just saw, that's a continuation of the kind of tax cuts that we saw with Reagan and things like that. So that's certainly kind of very much at home within this kind of thinking, especially the, free, the, the trade agreements that Trump wants to renegotiate, maybe uh, tariffs that he's implementing. That's coming from a different kind of thinking. And, and, and let's be clear, neoliberals do, and it's stronger in somebody like Milton Friedman, do have a commitment in some way to, to democracy. Um, that's there. They think it's a good thing. They think it does the best to preserve neoliberal, um, uh, or <laughs> preserve kind of private freedom, um, uh, free markets, capitalism. They go hand in hand. That's one of Friedman's arguments. Trump divorces himself from those. They also do have some conception of equality by um, enacting policies uh, that fly in the face, become almost authoritarian, fly in the face of, of, of any kind of commitment to equality. Um, dividing people up according to religions and races and things like that. So I hope that answers the question uh, to some degree, or do you want to, not so much? Yeah. I, I, I'm just still confused about who the neoliberals are. I, yeah, so the idea would be. Not neoliberal. Excuse me? The current administration is not neoliberal. It does have some policies that are, it does have some policies that are not. That would be the idea. Trump, you know, but Trump has certainly taken a big step outside of it. The person who most represents this way of thinking would have been Hillary Clinton yeah, in the election. Yeah, um, so both uh, uh, Hayek and von Mises grew up in the, uh, in the last days of the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, which is famously liberal but also authoritarian. 
And I was just wondering, do you think that had, think they were basically being nostalgic for the good? Well, yeah, yeah, sure. I wonder uh, with this, you know, that that's a deeply, let's say, un-American sentiment. Um, and uh, yes, uh, I, I do. I haven't looked into it, but sometimes my thought is, well, where are they coming from? And to look into the history and the background even more as to what formed their um, thinking and even the Austrian School of Economics. That's something I haven't done, but that could very well be true. But, um, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. I think Matt has uh, well, woken us up <laughs> to uh, some of the problems that we face and um, uh, food for thinking and I think food for thought and food for more conversation all through the day. Thank you very much, Matt. You. you have about uh, 12 minutes uh, to... Uh, play, <laughs> have coffee and whatever, and we'll be back with you at 11.